Hello everybody, Cameron Porter with Guns Explained, and you're watching 10 things that you need to know about mass shootings. Now, that title is a little bit misleading. I mean, don't get me wrong, we'll be telling you at least 10 things that you need to know about mass shootings, but this is not a list video. This is a discussion video and it's a problem solving video. The purpose of this episode is to bring us together on what happened in Parkland, when a troubled young man went on a shooting rampage at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, murdering 17 people and injuring 17 more. I don't know about you, but what happened in Parkland makes me really mad. Reading the bios of the victims published in, by NPR is heartbreaking. Let's come together on this. First, let's find our common ground. Regardless of how you feel about guns, I think we can all agree on two things. One, we all want to prevent more mass shootings. We should all be on board with this. Hopefully, we at least have this in common. And number two, we have to give each other the benefit of the doubt. We have to be willing to assume that the other side does share our goal of preventing mass shootings. If we can't do that, and we assume that they have some evil or irrational intentions, then we're gonna get nowhere. So as long as we're all willing to agree to those two points, we can move forward. So first, let's do a little bit of basic info on mass shootings. Number one, mass shootings is actually a relative term and it's changed definitions over time. Uh, right now, the definition is uh, any shooting with three or more fatalities, not counting the shooter. It used to be four or more fatalities, not counting the shooter, and other countries still measure it differently than we do. Number two, the term law enforcement uses is active shooter incidents, uh, which is obviously different from mass shooter, but it's more accurate in covering their bases. After all, an active shooter that was only able to kill two victims uh, before he was stopped is still valuable to include in a data set uh, when you're analyzing these mass shooter incidents. Number three, in a study of 160 active shooter incidents that the FBI did from 2000 to 2013, only six of them were perpetrated by females. Number four, the rate of active shooter incidents is increasing. Now these stats come from the FBI report, you can see the link down here. So every active shooter situation or mass shooting follows the same basic process. Number one, something makes the killer decide to kill. Something motivates them to want to kill a lot of people. Number two, the killer makes plans, including deciding on what weapons to use. And number three, the killer carries out his plan. Now, ideally, we would prevent the mass shooting here by figuring out why more and more people are deciding to kill other people and solving the problem before it manifests. But do we really have to know why they're happening? Well, theoretically, no. If we look back at the process, a mass killing can either be uh, mitigated or even prevented entirely if the perpetrator is thwarted at any step of the process. If, for example, a troubled student is unable to access a firearm, uh, he won't be shooting up any schools because he is simply unable to. Now, that being said, he may choose another weapon, like the student that attempted to bomb a school in St. George, Utah just a couple of weeks ago. But perhaps, for some students, it would be enough of a deterrent that they would never actually go through with their plans of mass murder. Let's look, at the, let's look at another proposition that's been getting a lot of attention recently, allowing educators to be armed on school grounds. The idea is to allow teachers who wish to carry concealed while on school grounds to do so and provide them with training and instruction. These programs are already in place in several places across the country. And in fact, our season finale last year was about an, uh, about an amazing program here in Utah that does just that. There's a ton of pushback on that idea but most of the pushback that I have heard has been based on the misconception that, teacher, that this would somehow be mandatory and that teachers would be forced to carry even if they were not comfortable doing so. And that is not the case. I have not heard that proposed anywhere. The idea is simply for those teachers who want to take the responsibility, they are allowed to do so. They're given the tools to do so. I like this idea. I mean, it's not a silver bullet, but even a cursory look into how mass shootings happen will show that almost always when the shooter is confronted, the killing stops. When someone starts firing back at the shooter, they get all his attention. And even if, heaven forbid, the shooter wins the engagement, that buys everyone else priceless time to get clear. And it buys the police priceless time to arrive on the scene and take over. But banning guns, 
allowing teachers to be armed, and even metal detectors and armed guards at schools have one thing in common. None of them address the root cause or why more people are perpetrating mass shootings. Even if these ideas are successful in stopping the shootings, we're kidding ourselves if we think that other symptoms of that root cause are not going to surface. A person who wants to commit a mass shooting is hardly going to magically become a well-adjusted contributing member of society just because he can't get a gun. As any good doctor will tell you, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. None of the ideas we're hearing are prevention, it's all cure. If we want to prevent not only mass shootings, but other negative societal impacts, we have to, number one, figure out why are they happening. So how do we figure that out? Well, let's pick a few culprits and see if the data supports it. First, guns. Is the availability of firearms the reason mass killings are happening? The data does not support this. First, despite what the politicians will t are saying, mass shootings do happen in other countries. In fact, when you calculate mass shootings per capita, the US isn't even in the top 10 in well-developed countries. And according to PolitiFact, if the analysis wasn't just shootings, but included any kind of mass killings, such as stabbings, bombs, uh, terrorist attacks, uh, and cars, the US would be even further down the list. The truth is, guns are not made of some sentient alloy that slowly over time whispers in the ears of gun owners that they wanna go out and kill people. The mere fact that a gun exists in a home or is available for purchase does not motivate or guarantee that a mass shooting or even violent crime is going to occur. The motivation has to come from somewhere else, and the firearm is just the tool used to carry out the crime. But what about Australia? Pointing to Australia actually doesn't really hold any water, because even though armed robberies dropped by 33% from 2001 to 2008, conveniently that's actually, they started that calculation four years after the mandatory gun buyback, so they're kind of cheating there on the data, but both assaults and sexual assaults went up 40% and 20% respectively in the 10 years following the buyback in 1997. Now murders have gone down in Australia since 1997, but their murder rate was already on a downward trend before the gun buyback. And a two year spike occurred immediately after the gun buyback. So while the data is interesting, it's, it's nowhere close to making the case that stricter gun control laws reduce violent crime in general. So, we could also talk about the obscenely high violent crime rates in not only cities in the US with strict gun control laws, but also countries like the UK that have extremely strict gun control laws. But the point is, people who want to commit violent crimes are going to commit them with whatever weapons they have available. If they have a gun, they'll use that. If they have a kitchen knife, they'll use that. The prevalence of firearms in the US is not causing people to kill, want to kill each other. So what is it then? Well, here's another potential culprit. Are violent video games and violent media the reason mass shootings are happening more? This is the direction that many Republicans, including President Trump, are going with the conversation, and at least this attempts to address the issue of the root cause. Uh, it's, po it's possible that violent video games and mass shootings are related, but at most it can only be considered one of many risk factors. Uh, according to the American Psychological Association, back in 2015, 97% of all adolescents were play, ages 12 to 17 were playing video games, and 85% of video games have some form of violence in them. With only a tiny, tiny percentage of adolescents actually committing mass murder, it's really hard to make the case that violent video games are what's causing it. Now that said, a correlation between violent, playing violent video games and increased aggression has been established, but a causal relationship has not been established. In other words, it could be that naturally aggressive children are more inclined to play violent video games. We don't know what direction it goes. Uh, and even if a causal relationship had been established, increased aggression and mass shootings or mass murder are two very different things. So while it is still possible that there is a link between violent media and mass shootings, if it's there, it hasn't been discovered yet. So let's take a look at an idea that's gotten significantly less media attention. Is increased rates of fatherlessness causing the increase of mass shootings? Now for a lot of you, this may be coming out of left field, but here's where things get interesting. And by interesting, I mean depressing, sad, and painful. CNN looked at the deadliest mass shootings in US history and noted that six of the seven killers under the age of 30 grew up without a father. In addition, a Michigan State University study found that 75% of adolescent murderers came from fatherless homes. 
And the CDC found that 85% of children with behavioral disorders came from fatherless homes. To put that into perspective, according to the Census Bureau, in 2016, only 23% of children were living in a fatherless home. So 75% of the murders and 85% of behavioral disorders are coming from a segment that only represents 23% of the population. Back in 1987, a study by Raymond Knight and Robert Prensky of 108 violent rapists found that 60% of the rapists came from single-parent homes, and the percent of children living in single-parent homes was much lower then than it is now. And it's not just the U.S. This same phenomenon has been, has been consistently observed in New Zealand, Hawaii, and Australia. It has even been used successfully to predict violent crime rates in urban areas. According to the Census Bureau, the percentage of children living in families with two parents decreased from 88% to 69% from 1960 to 2016, which distinctly correlates with the increase in the rate of active shooter incidents. So what does all this mean? Does it mean that if you're a single mom, then there's nothing you can do to stop your son from being a criminal? Of course not. Many, many children grow up in single parent households and become successful, well-adapted members of society. And I know we would all love to believe that we as individual parents are enough for our children, but there is a reason that over tens of thousands of years of human history, people have not raised children by themselves. It is not sexist to say that a woman cannot teach a young man or young boy how to become a man. And I know I will readily admit that I have no clue how to teach my daughter how to be a woman. So if the data is to be believed, if we reduce fatherlessness, we will reduce mass shootings. How do we reduce fatherlessness? I don't need to get on my soapbox here. I think every mother can decide the best way to provide a stable male role model for their children. And single fathers can decide the best way to provide a strong female role model for their children. Honestly, going back to our first agreement to give each other the benefit of the doubt, I think that awareness is the biggest issue. If people are aware of the negative effects of raising their children without a male role model, they'll take steps to address the problem on their own with no need for more laws or regulation or government oversight. Parents love their kids and want what's best for them. So as long as they know what that is, they'll do their best to provide it. In light of that, I would like to ask you to please like our Facebook page if you're watching this on Facebook. If you're watching it on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. Share this video with everyone to try to give this issue the attention that it deserves. We have found, we have found what could very well be the root cause of why mass shootings are increasing. We owe it to ourselves, our children, and, the, and each other to give it our due diligence and work to raise awareness on this issue so that we can prevent more Parkland shootings from happening. So thank you. For Guns Explained, I'm Cameron Porter. We'll see you next week.